There's a great story of a bishop who said, Everywhere I go and speak about the Apostle Paul, they serve tea and cakes afterwards accompanied by polite conversation. Everywhere Paul went to speak, a riot broke out. Well, over the last few months, we have travelled with Paul on his three long missionary journeys through the Roman Empire, visiting cities in what we would call modern Turkey, as well as in Syria, Macedonia, Greece and the Greek islands. And on these travels, we have witnessed him getting into a fair amount of trouble, where at times he and his companions got threatened or imprisoned or whipped or stoned by the locals. As Dan informed us last week, Paul had just completed his third long and arduous missionary journey and was heading back to Jerusalem and got arrested. On some occasions, Paul got into trouble for what he said in proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. But on this occasion, he got into trouble for trumped up charges, supposedly teaching people against the law and the temple, and that he had supposedly taken a Gentile friend, Trophimus, into the temple. Non-Jews were allowed into the outer courts or the precincts of the Jewish temple, which were aptly named Court of the Gentiles. <laughs> you didn't see that one coming, did you? But the Court of the Gentiles was separated from the inner courts where only Jewish people could enter. And there was a wall four and a half feet high, and on this wall there were many warning signs written in Latin and in Greek uh, declaring that any trespasser beyond this point would be killed, which I suppose you might say was uh, a little bit of a disincentive. As ever, Paul is right in the middle of this chaotic scene. Luke tells us that the whole city was aroused and that people were running from all directions, seizing Paul and dragging him into the temple. I read the other day on a life insurance website that some occupations are regarded as high risk and might therefore incur higher premium payments like people working in the armed forces, roofers and scaffolders, firefighters, lion tamers and youth pastors and so on. If they had life insurance companies in Paul's day, I think he would have been refused point blank a policy. And yet again, Paul is in the middle of this riot. They were about to kill him and Roman soldiers came to Paul's rescue. The soldiers were probably more concerned about maintaining peace and order for which they were responsible than they were in saving Paul's life. In the uproar, the Roman commander tried to get some understanding on what the disturbance was all about. And some were shouting one thing, others were shouting something else. The commander couldn't get much sense out of the crowd, so he ordered that Paul be taken to the barracks. And this is where we pick up our story this morning, in Acts chapter 21, verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? he replied. Aren't you the, the, the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago. Now, the word for terrorist that Luke uses is the word sicari, literally meaning dagger men. These were violent assassins who committed many murders in the broad daylight in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. And their favorite trick was to mingle with the crowds, concealing their daggers under their, their garments and then strike. And when a victim fell, the assassins just melted away into the crowd, defying de detection. And as you can imagine, they aroused a terrible fear in the hearts of the people. And the Roman commander thought that Paul was the notorious leader of these political extremists who had managed to escape. Talk about getting the wrong man. Verse 39. Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defence. I find that utterly amazing. Paul had virtually caused a riot just by being there, and then has a quiet word with the commander who allows him 
to speak to the guys who were trying to kill him. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Now Aramaic was the language that uh, most Palestinian Jews spoke. Paul then tells them a story, his story. Paul's testimony is found in the book of Acts in th on three occasions. Luke tells us of what happened on the Damascus Road in chapter 9. But then Paul tells his own story to this riotous crowd in chapter 22. And we will once more hear the story being told. And on that occasion it's to King Agrippa in chapter 26. And Paul wisely decided to give the crowd his personal testimony. And in this passage he uses personal pronouns, I, me, my, some 33 times. Anyone who has ever been baptised in our church will have always had an interview with me in preparation for their baptism. And I always ask a person being baptised to write out their personal story. I ask them to think about their spiritual journey in three areas. And the three words that I give them are before, how and since. What were you like before? What was life like before you came to Christ? How did it all happen for you? What caused the change? And what has Jesus done in your life since? Basically, what are the changes? In which way has he transformed your life? Obviously, our testimony isn't just something that happens to us when we first became a follower of Jesus. The God of grace continues to be at work in our lives in both the highs and the lows. And our testimony in that regard needs to be up to date. Don't underestimate though, the power of your testimony. You might think that your story is nothing special or maybe quite ordinary. God loves using the ordinary for his purposes, before, how and since. And that's the way that Paul tells his story here in Acts chapter 22. First of all, he speaks of the before, before he was a follower of Christ. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, speaking of Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women, and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Catch that. Firstly, he spoke their language, literally. He spoke to them in their own mother tongue, Aramaic. He got their attention. And then Luke tells us in verse 2, When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. They were immediately grabbed by this guy. I think it's so important that when we speak to others, that we do so in their language. There is nothing less appealing, more confusing, and more cringeworthy than sharing your faith with others in religious jargon. Church speak, or as I like to call it, Christianese, is as much a foreign language as Chinese to most people, unless you're Chinese, of course. And words like sin, saved, born again, salvation, discipleship, repentance, personal saviour, all need deciphering and recasting in a society that no longer has a Christian foundation. We also see Paul identified with his hearers. Basically, he was saying, I understand you guys. I'm a Jew too. I was actually trained by Professor Gamaliel. Now, the name might not mean much to us today, but to the Jewish crowd, Gamaliel was certainly a big cheese. The most important and honoured rabbi, probably in the entire first century. And Paul is also saying, I was just as zealous as you are today. I was just like you a few years ago. I also persecuted the followers of the way. The early Christians were known as the way. Even the high priest can vouch for me. I get you. I understand you. 
Now Paul's journey uh, story, sorry, was unique, and and so is yours. Let me encourage you today by telling you that nothing is wasted by God. Your upbringing, your background, your culture, your family, your education, your experiences, your spiritual encounters, your skills, your trials, your hurts, and even your doubts. As a pastor, it has been my privilege and is my privilege to come alongside people who are going through the tough times, times of great trial and suffering. And when I do, I'm always very careful not to say to them, I know what you're going through. Unless, of course, I have experienced something of their pain personally in my own life. And even then, I can't guarantee that their experience or, or hurt is identical to mine. I would most often say, I can only imagine the hurt that you're experiencing. But that is very different to saying that I know what you're experiencing. A Christian who has gone through a miscarriage will be able to speak more powerfully about God's love and comfort during those hard times than someone who hasn't experienced that trauma. A number of years ago, our friends Anna and Robin were able to do that, having experienced that trauma on several occasions. They were able to bring words of comfort and hope to other families who were experiencing what they had experienced. The person who has known the anguish of divorce, the hurt and pain of betrayal, financial struggles, the sharing of young children, is in a privileged position to help someone else who has experienced and is experiencing that same trauma. The person who has experienced serious illness or disablement will have an insight into, into life that maybe others don't have. The pain of bereavement of a close family member, a husband or a wife or losing a child, often equips a person to share God's love with others who are experiencing the same agony. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Catch that. He comforts us in all our troubles so we can comfort others. We receive comfort and grace, we pass it on. We are conduits or channels of the same grace that we ourselves have received. And I believe that your greatest ministry will come out of your deepest hurt because you can relate to what others are going through. It might not be straight away, but I can guarantee that it will be before you are fully healed. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because we will only be fully healed when we get to see Jesus face to face. Our mess of yesterday can become our message today. Our test can become our testimony and our misery can become our ministry. Secondly, Paul speaks of the how, how he came to faith. Verse 6, about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand to Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Verse 12. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptised, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. 
I think it is so important to be honest about our story. I've actually heard people in the past glamorize their testimony. Probably not the right word. Maybe a better word would be embellish or enhance or even exaggerate their story to make it sound a little bit more dramatic, spice it up a bit. Well, please, please, please do not be tempted to do that. If you keep the faith as a child in a Christian home, then thank God for your story. If you trusted in Jesus in your early teens because a friend invited you to a youth event, then praise God for that. If your story of conversion appears to be very mundane and unspectacular, for you there was no writing in the sky, no voice from heaven, no miraculous healing, no deeply devotional spiritual encounter, as it was for me, then your story will undoubtedly speak to some who might not be able to relate as easily to the more dramatic conversion stories. Unlike me and unlike many of you, Paul did have a remarkable encounter. Do you notice the two questions that he asked? Firstly, who are you? <clears throat> and secondly, what shall I do? The reply was, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And get up, the Lord said, and go into J Damascus. There you will be told all that you've been assigned to do. In that moment of time, Paul realized that he had been totally wrong about Jesus. He had previously seen him as yet another false prophet in a long line of false prophets who had arisen claiming to be a Messiah. But in that moment of physical blindness, he received spiritual sight. That sounds about right for many of us. As we look back, we realize that we got Jesus all wrong. Until that is, we encountered him and he changed everything for us. Much in the way the scales fell from Paul's eyes when Ananias prayed for him, those spiritual scales fell from our eyes and we saw Jesus in a totally new light. What shall I do, said Paul? Go to Damascus and you'll be given instructions later. Well, at Damascus, Paul was introduced to Ananias, a godly man who was sent by God to Paul. Ananias prayed for him to be healed and he was healed and to baptize him, which he did. And as for the earliest Christians, baptism followed belief in Christ very closely. They didn't wait until they had totally understood Leviticus or had been on a discipleship course or had attended Alpha for three times. It was a matter of believe and be baptized. Baptism is a sacrament, meaning it is an outward expression of an inward reality. What do I mean by that? Well, on the inside, there has been a dying to the old and coming alive to Christ, a new creation in Christ, which is symbolized by the going down into the water and coming up again. Water baptism isn't some optional extra for the Christian believer. It's a wonderful, wonderful and powerful illustration of what God has done in you. And I thank God for all those Christian men and women who have had the same spirit as An Ananias, those lovely people who are receptive to the Spirit of God, those who are willing to become messengers to those new in the faith. And maybe as you look back on your own spiritual journey, just think about that for a moment. Ask the question, who were those people, those Ananiases to you? Who helped you get established and helped you bring a strong, build a strong foundation? Often they were the most unlikely people, yet through their encouragement, through their prayers, through their gracious actions, through the time invested that uh, they helped you to be able to stand strong in your faith. And I'd just like to put the idea to you today. Did you know that you too can be an Ananias to someone else? Why not talk to God about it? Thirdly, Paul speaks of the since, before, how and since. That is what God had done in his life since he trusted in Jesus. Verse 21, Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Very simply, Paul was called 
by God for a ministry and a mission that was to reach out to the world beyond Israel. God's original intention in calling a people to himself was to bless them in order for them to be a blessing to others. That was God's intention all along. In Genesis chapter 12, we read of God calling Abraham to be the father of the nation of Israel. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and you will, I will make you your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and, to, and all peoples of earth will be blessed through you. You see the Jews either misunderstood or ignored their calling which was to be blessed by God in order to be a blessing to others, to be a light to the Gentiles. Instead of being a light to them, they so often despised them and regarded them as sinful and unholy. But that all changed. For after the day of Pentecost, after the coming and the empowering of the Spirit, the gospel is unleashed. The disciples become courageous witnesses, filled with the Spirit, declaring the good news, not only in Jerusalem and Judea, but to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Then in verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. That is the bit about the Gentiles. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. I think it's important to realise that not everyone will pat you on the back because you have become a follower of Jesus. For some of you, becoming a Christian will make life even more difficult than it was before. God doesn't promise to wrap us up in cotton wool when we follow him. Actually, quite the opposite. Jesus says that this is the narrow gate and the narrow road that we travel on. Well, let me just come into land. This very long series over the last few months of journeying with these early Christians, seeing individuals and communities transformed as the gospel was unleashed, has not been just some history lesson or theology class, but rather our objective in this series has been all about seeing God at work and to be reminded that the God who was with those early disciples is also the God who is with us today. The one who is yesterday, today and forever the same. He is the one who has commissioned us also to reach out to our friends, to our colleagues, to our families, to our communities, with the good news of Jesus. God gave you a story and he gave you a story for a reason. God gave you a story so you can give it away. It might have been quite a while since you last shared some part of your story with others. Why not ask God this week to open a door of opportunity so that you can be an Ananias or even a Paul to others. Ask God for the courage and ask him also for the wisdom and sensitivity. So don't forget, our mess of yesterday can become our message of today. Our test can become our testimony and our misery can become our ministry. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. Have a great week.